So, hello my relatives, it's good to see you here today. Um, my name is Leona Antoine and I'm the facilitator for the panel today. Um, I wanted to welcome you with a, um, an open heart and a warm handshake and um, to um, first of all um, start off speaking. I'm a Lakota language learner and so I start in the language when I can to help guide my thinking and um, to honor the, the knowledge that we have here with us. Um, but I did want to say, you know, welcome in our language. Um, we are excited to have you joining us here for this uh, momentous occasion for the 25th anniversary celebration of We the Peoples Before. And our mission at First Peoples Fund is to honor and support the collective spirit of First People artists and culture bearers. Our work recognizes the power of art and culture to bring about positive change in Native communities, beginning with individual artists and their families. Before we begin, let us acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territory of the Piscataway, Pumunki, and Nintego, Nanichoke, Matapani, Chikahomini, Monacan, and Pabahatan, Regional tribes have, or have and continue to serve as stewards of these lands, and may we all continue to do the work of uplifting these communities and all indigenous peoples at this site of national and international convergence. So again, my name is Leona Antoine. I'm one of the education fellows for the um, We the Peoples Before event. And um, my role as an education fellow is to um, help create curriculum based on the long history of First Peoples Fund with the culture bearers that they work with and with the event that um, we were able to experience last night. So welcome to the session. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our panelists today. So uh, first we have Richard West, who is a citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma and a Peace Chief of the Southern Cheyenne. Uh, he is the founding director of Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian and has devoted his professional life and much of his uh, personal life to working with American Indians on cultural, educational, legal, and governmental issues. Before becoming the director of the National Museum of the American Indian, West was a partner in the Washington DC office of Freed Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson, and subsequently in the Indian-owned Albuquerque law firm of Gover, Stetson, Williams, and West PC, he served as general counsel and special counsel to numerous tribes and organizations. Um, on the other side here we have Sherry Selway Black, who is Oglala Lakota, and originally from South Dakota, she has worked for more than 40 years in American Indian issues at the American Indian Policy Review Commission, Indian Health Service, First Nations Development Institute, and with the National Congress of American Indians. She has served um, on numerous boards and committees. Sherry has a Master's of Business Administration degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor's from East Stroudsburg University where in 2013, she received the Distinguished Alumni Award. In 2016, Sherry received a special Distinguished Leadership Award from the National Congress of the American Indians. So we have, um, or help me welcome them today. <laughs> so um, normally when we think about policy, it's not really something that we get too excited about, right? Um, but being able to be here in the presence of these two individuals, um, we have a really unique opportunity here to learn firsthand, um, not only about policy affecting Native Americans, Alaskan Indians, and um, Hawaiians, but also um, 
the firsthand experience of the work that went into some of this and knowing the effects that happen as a result. Um, and so I want to first just talk about the, um, the title that we have for our topic or for our session today. And we're looking at policy, um, but there's also this word dispossession. And so um, what in the title, the word dispossession, what does that entail when we think about policy? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I will go ahead and start out. And one of the things I thought about, how many in the room here were at the performance last evening? So most. And I, to me, I said, well, I don't know that we even need to do the panel today because that was all about this possession. And what we learned in that session, in, in the performances, was amazing. And it, it, it was a learning experience for me. I'm always amazed after spending 40 years, um, more than 40 years in this field that I'm still learning about Native people and what has happened to them, you know. And I don't know if how many of you knew the story of Virginia um, and what the, uh, it came out and it talked about the, you know, there was only white and black in Virginia. There was, you couldn't identify as, as Indian in Virginia as a Native person. So I think dispossession to me really means and taking away from, you know, something that is taking something away from from people. And, you know, we could go on a litany of um, the laws over the centuries that have done that and what have taken away things from people. And I was struck just with um, uh, the introductions here because you can pick out things like um, really identifying us as citizens of our tribal nations. That's a relatively new concept that we've all started talking about it. And before, you know, when I started out, you were a member of a tribe. And we have really grown to, I think, again, put our own stamp on this to say, our nations, they're our nations. We are citizens of those nations. We're not just members. And so, again, it's it, maybe I'm sort of jumping ahead in the sense of looking at the impact of policies have had for us. So when you remove something from people, you put something else in its place, and it was having us define ourselves as members rather than citizens mm -hmm. of the nation. And I think those are the kinds of things that we'll be talking about mm -hmm. no I, I I think the word is is apt uh, and I, I've not seen it used that much before but but I think it's very descriptive and the reason dispossession uh, makes sense to me is because dispossession implies somebody else trying to take something away it's not that we freely gave it up uh, we were dispossessed of certain kinds of things uh, historically. And, and so I think the word makes sense to me in describing it. And we'll talk more about the scope of it, but uh, just reflecting on, on what was just said as, as well as uh, uh, the work that um, has sort of consumed my life, the dispossession was, was multiple. It was political, legal, violated the Constitution, but they used legal instruments to try to take it away. It was military. Um, but the most devastating dispossession, in my own view, sat on the cultural front. And we will go into more detail about that, I'm sure. Uh, but that was the most costly, I think, to us. Because uh, with culture, without culture, you, you cease to exist in some respects. Um, and and so the beginning point was was very devastating, I think, for anybody who belongs to a native community. Okay, thank you. Um, when we talk about policies affecting tribes, tribal groups, um, and different nations, I know this is a really tough question, but what types, if you could think of like different types of policies that were created, what are some of the types that you can identify? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'll start if you want. Yep. So, yeah, I'll, I'll just pick up where I left off. And it's based on both uh, personal history and personal experience, and not my own personal history, but my dad's, for example. I think the most devastating aspect of, of uh, Native policy, and it was indeed that, it was explicit, it was described as attempting to achieve what I'm just about to say, and so there was no ambiguity about it. It, it, was, it was something that was meant to destroy. And that is what I would say happened after the war period, uh, which finally wrapped up to our great detriment in, say, the late 19th century, 1885 or so. And then what happened was the reservation period um, of, of the early late 19th and early 20th century and uh, what grew out of that, which was supposed to be a favor, uh, was that the administration of Native affairs uh, moved from the military to churches. I mean, the agencies were turned over to various churches. And I always wondered why my dad was an Episcopalian, because he didn't strike me as much of an Episcopalian. Uh, but he was an Episcopalian because he was uh, in boarding schools run by Anglican nuns uh, at the time. And that, that was a set of policies supposedly stated in educational terms. But the objective of the policy was deculturalization. No question about it. It was A, to break up Native communities um, by, by breaking up their lands because the allotment period came along with all of this and to assimilate them into um, Anglo society uh, and, and for people to cease to be Native uh, in these communities. And it was, uh, it was, it was devastating. Uh, my dad spent the first 20 years of his life in a boarding school. As did as did two of his uh, two of his brothers, um, removed at age four or five, put into a boarding school, and he did not emerge until he was in his early twenties uh, from Haskell, uh, where all of his all of his brothers went, and um, you know that was uh, the intention was very specific. It was to shatter the community and to reassemble it somewhere else. It was to deconstruct everything we had been, even though we had suffered much of the damage in the military period during the 19th century. Um, the, the era I'm talking about, which really went from about the, the late 19th century until 1920, until the New Deal came along in the 1930s, was, was the policy I've just described. And it was explicitly to deculturalize using the name of education to do it which was particularly objectionable. Well, I think I'd like to pick up on what Rick was talking about because I think all of these policies are personal um, in the sense that I find it helpful to, when I introduce myself sometimes, to give that background of the policies that have happened in Indian country and how they have affected and brought me to where I am today. And that's the story of our parents, our grandparents. Um, you know, if I look at the, I was born on Pine Ridge, um, but my parents moved off in the 50s and part of the relocation effort. So in terms of looking at what was the policy of relocation and how did it affect folks. Um, and it was, a, you know, definitely they wanted to remove Native people from reservations. This was after World War II, um, the men were coming back from serving, uh, as my father did in the military. Um, my mom was a nurse on the reservation. During the war years, uh, women who were in nursing school could serve in various places. One of them was reservations. So that's how my mom and dad met. And again, you know, looking at, at how all of these policies have affected us, um, my father was a boarding school. He well, he refused to go to boarding school, and he ran away um, in the sixth grade and went and worked in a beet field in Wyoming, you know, and stuff because he did not want. So he had a sixth grade education, in essence. So how he and my mother left the reservation, wanting to educate the kids 
um, get them a better education, have a good job, you know, all of those kinds of things. And you look at where Native people are today in the urban areas, and it is in those relocation cities that were the major ones, you know, um, Dallas, Seattle, Los Angeles, Chicago, you know, Minneapolis, New York, uh, I'm trying to think of other other ones, Phoenix, you know, you can think of those major areas where where Native people went and, and what an impact that had on the activism of the late 50s and 60s and 70s and leading into today. So our stories are really all about these policies and, and how they um, affected people, you know, our families and how they continue to do that today. So it's not in the you know, even you go back to the Dawes Allotment Act from 1887 and those things, they are dramatically affecting us today on the reservation. So I know that's true for, you know, probably everyone in this room in the sense of thinking about the policies that are still, you know, 1887 to today and, and they're still affecting us. So I like to personalize it, you know, a little bit, so, which you did as well. So. Uh, going to be my next question. Some of the outcomes that we still see present day yeah. from these policies. So policies, you know, from 200 years ago, how are those still impacting us today? And mm -hmm. what are some of the outcomes? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that uh, you can describe them in both uh, political legal terms and, and cultural terms. Um, the policies that I was talking about <clears throat> kind of join, conjoin that which Sherry was talking about. Um, the cultural damage was simply losing culture or having culture threatened, even though there were those who persisted and hung on to it. I can remember as a kid uh, growing up in uh, Oklahoma <clears throat> where there was a regulation that technically I think still sits in the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, which outlaws ceremonies like the Sundance. Uh, and so there was a period in the late 40s, 50s, when the Sundance went underground. And I just happened to be before I came here because I was attending some Sundance-related uh, ceremonies, the Arrow Keepers Lodge, uh, in Sealing, Oklahoma. You know, this small town way in the outback of, of western Oklahoma, but part of what had been the Shine Arapaho Reservation before was was uh, was uh, uh, opened up, you know, to white settlement, and and uh, so that was part of the damage that that if you persisted, you might be doing something illegal, and they would try to stop it, um, but at the same time there were these elements of, of resilience and resistance. Uh, by people who persisted in doing those kinds of things. So that was one set of things. And then what Sherry alluded to, which is terribly important, is what happened in the 50s when there was a legal attempt, a statutory attempt to deconstruct Indian country by simply terminating reservations. And that got only so far, fortunately, it began under Eisenhower in the 50s, and it happened to the Menominee, when, and we saw evidence of that in some of what was in the production last night. Um, and were it not for Ada Deer and her colleagues, it would probably still be that way. Um, but that was an attempt, that was a, an especially brutal attempt, uh, because it was, it was from a legal standpoint declaring Indian country simply didn't exist and reservations were no longer in this special relationship with the national government, um, and you were deported, if you will, to the cities. And that had its own set of issues. Um, Sherry's family, I'm sure, struggled valiantly with that and was successful in doing it, but, but basically natives were sent into the cities with no pre-thinking, no planning ahead of time. Uh, and and were were just left um, by themselves in, in that situation. It was it was incredibly destructive. That period ended reasonably quickly when Kennedy and Johnson came along in the '60s because they 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 lifted the the efforts to terminate additional reservations. Um, but still, much damage done in terms of legal status and cultural wholeness. 
one thing I was going to mention, um, some of my background is in healthcare. And when you think about the disruptions starting from removal to reservations, removal from your traditional homelands, and the implications on your diet, um, and you look at the implications today um, in terms of diabetes and, and all of those kinds of things happen because of many of these policies. Uh, I learned um, the Tohono O'odham um, tribe in Arizona, which is along the border there, um, I think I'm correct in saying it has one of the highest rates of diabetes in the country. Prior to, um, right at the end of World War II, they had none, no diabetes in their population. And when the men left to go serve in the military, they came back, they didn't go back to their traditional work, um, to growing their own food, to eating their own food. They moved into the cities and within one generation, 60% of the people had either diabetes personally or someone in their family had diabetes. I mean, just in that short amount of time, how a policy um, and how you know lifestyle changes can really dramatically affect um, uh, your health mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and other outcomes. Yeah. And just, that's another impact. To, to just give a personal example of that, to personalize it. When I was a kid growing up in Oklahoma, we often, for, for dessert, <laughs> as awful as this sounds, had white bread, butter on it, or margarine on it, and then sugar put on top of it. And when you think of it, that's a, that's a combination for disaster, for health. But what it harkened back to is when my dad was in boarding schools, it, it was even worse. It was still white bread, but it was lard, animal lard, that was put on the bread, and then sugar on top of that. And, and it, was, it, was, it was devastating. There is, interestingly enough, Sherry, sort of a happier ending to the story that you were telling about Tahana O'odham, where for people in that region of Arizona, southern Arizona, uh, the the diabetes rate just skyrocketed after after World War II, mm -hmm. but a very good friend of mine named Donna House, who is a Navajo oh, eth okay. yeah, is a Navajo ethnobotanist, mm -hmm. helped the Tahano Odom probably a good twenty years ago, mm -hmm. um, sort of harkened because of her knowledge of native plants, harkened back to the traditional diet. Right. And they have already begun seeing results from that mm -hmm. in the reduction of the rates of, of diabetes. Right. So um, hope springs eternal, I, know. I guess, I know. in that regard. That's interesting. Yeah, my sister actually was just there um, in, in Tohono O'odham yeah. last week um, working with them on food sovereignty. And yeah, she was talking go. about the organic <laughs> food, you yeah. know, and everything that she learned there. So, yeah. um, you know, almost as... As quickly as these are coming in, we're able to now start to make those changes. Um, yeah. Have there ever been, a, I mean, has there ever been a policy that has had a positive impact? <laughs> well, on well, well, let me see. I think you can do it on one hand. But, <laughs> but I used in, to teach high school students, and I'm just thinking right, of like the types right. of questions. Right? And so. No, I, I, I think you, you got to. You just got to fess up to the fact that it's been a fairly negative drill for, for most of history. There are changes that, that, that did happen um, that, that made some sense. I would, I would give at least as some example of a slightly more positive shift. What became the Indian New Deal under Roosevelt um, put a stop to what had happened from the late 19th century to the 2020s, uh, to the 20th century with the Miriam Report, mm -hmm. which was, again, sort of signaled the end of it all. Um, and so that was, you know, that, that had a positive twist to it, but then there's always a reverse twist that somehow gets in the mix too, because what the Indian New Deal did was to recognize that the tribal governments were governments and had certain sovereign and self powers of self-government that were unique to our ethnic community as contrasted with others, and that was good. But it had sort of an imprimatur. It had a form of constitution that came along with the bargain. 
And so there were lots of IRA constitutions um, uh, that, that sprang up then. And so that made it a little bit of a mix because it impinged upon other more traditional forms of governance, um, judicial process, etc. For example, in the, at CNA and China Rappo in, in Oklahoma, we're, we're sort of a combination. The, uh, there is an IRA constitution that was adopted in the 1930s and 40s uh, that is our governing instrument. Uh, and yet, that's a role that historically was filled by the Society of Peace Chiefs. But now what the division is, is that the, the, the Peace Chiefs really oversee the, the ceremonial side of life. Uh, with the tribe, and so that's good because that gives us a, a kind of a traditional hold on ceremonial practice. But again, it's it's sort of this divided government. So, and and then I would say the other example of that, just quickly, is when they ended termination, uh, when Eisenhower, who had started it, had it ended by the Kennedy administration just a few short years later, and that was positive, probably. Um. I came to Washington in 1976, and as um, Leona mentioned, I worked for the American Indian Policy Review Commission, which was the only, to this day, I think, commission set up by Congress to study Native issues. And um, that was in, it started in 1974, and it grew out of the activism um, of the 60s and the 70s, uh, the statement Nixon made in 1970 uh, about the special message to Congress about Native people, and it led to this two decades, I think, of amazing amounts of legislation for Native people. Um, public Law 93, 430, no, no, 94, 437. 437 is the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. The one before that is 93638, right. the Indian Self-Determination Act, which has been modified to be the Self-Governance Act. But I think those have really, um, they haven't gone far enough, probably, yeah. but, but just in the sense of to be positive, to address the unmet health care needs was the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, not that it has, and just because it hasn't been budgeted fully, um, but that was intended to be positive. Uh, it added in, uh, one of the titles added in urban Indian. So it really tried to look at, we can't have this sort of separation between urban reservation groups. And then 638, uh, I mean, what, what a dramatic sort of shift that has been in the sense of tribes being able to exercise their sovereignty more fully and to set up governments and, and deal with what Rick was saying, the IRA governments, many have changed their constitutions um, from the IRA, which was intended to be beneficial, you know, and has unforeseen consequences. And so to move on and to really build up their governments, their institutions, um, so really, you know, whether it is... Um, our schools, for sure. The, if you look at the sort of the Indian controlled school movement, that kind of grew out of that too. So it really, that to me has been a real positive. Um, yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with that. Oh. Yeah. Let me add to that. Jennifer Bates Abra in 1977 created the Senate Select Committee on Indian Affairs. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the reason he did that was because he saw issues coming to Washington, D.C. that went nowhere, nothing got done. Mm -hmm. uh, so 1977, and so out of that time came the <coughs> Indian Religious Freedom Act, mm -hmm. the Indian mm -hmm. Health Welfare Act of 638 mm -hmm. in that realm. Before Senator Everest left, he asked Sue Johnson, Sue Jackson, mm -hmm. to continue. So now they made a permanent Senate yeah, no, thank, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's really great to see a listing of all of the laws yeah, from, from yeah. like 1970. And, it, and it's kind of, 
odd in a way because I, I, I will confess that I, I'm, I'm not a Republican. Um, and <laughs> and uh, so much of what we've just been talking about came out of, of the, of the Abares Committee when he set up the special committee, uh, which then became the Senate Indian Committee. Uh, but it also came out of the Nixon administration. I mean, the, 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 all the legislation we've been talking about, it includes even the um, uh, Indian Education Act was, was in that string of uh, pieces of legislation. And I, I often wonder, how, how did that happen <laughs> in the Nixon administration? It happened because there were, there were um, people uh, who s sat in the White House at that time. His White House, believe it or not, was one of the first White Houses that had people actually in senior staff positions dealing with Indian affairs. And they were very active. Um, and, and so much came out of that period. But I'd also reference that, you know, think of what else was going on then. That was, that was the time of Wounded Knee. That was the time of Native activism through the American Indian Movement. So, so the urge for reform was becoming kind of a movement, really, and a movement that was very broad and wide. And, and uh, it was a very fertile time. You know, for, for these kinds of, it's when uh, Taos got Blue Lake back, and that was an administrative action. Yeah. That didn't even require legislation. <laughs> so, so there, you know, there have been some, there have been some lights turned on along the way, but, <laughs> but then somebody keeps switching them off. Yeah. <laughs> Little sparks here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so thinking of that, you know, the majority are the, um, <clears throat> dealing with, you know, the negative side and then the positive side and really looking at our relationship with, um, how many times do you take an insult before you, you know, before you tarnish <laughs> that relationship, right? And so looking at the tribal relationship with the federal government, this really kind of gives you a better idea of what that relationship looks like, you know, and just how much harder, um, tribes have to work, you know, to mm -hmm. get that, mm -hmm. That visibility. So um, today, what what do present day policies affecting Native American, Alaskan, Indian people intend to do? Like, what are some trends that you're seeing um, present day? I guess I guess the thing that makes me hopeful uh, under the circumstances is this, and the circumstances are that there are not ready friends anywhere in the government at this point. Mm -hmm. I think the administration, this administration, is supportive of many of the positive things that we have been talking about, um, as was the case in the, the Nixon administration uh, and what was happening then. Um, but um, speaking as a lawyer, what has happened with the Supreme Court is terribly threatening as far as Native communities go. Uh, we could rely upon the Supreme Court at one time. The very first case that, that uh, I ever was involved with as a young, as a puppy lawyer, and our offices were right across the street in the first Watergate office building that you see over there, where Freed Frank's offices were, was the, um, was the, the Black Hills case. And that was the question of whether that was actually a taking rather than just a reimbursement, if you will, for certain lands affected by subsequent actions of the government and others. And that, that case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and it was a taking. And that, that money now sits on account in the government, in the Treasury, and probably is worth in excess of a billion dollars. Now, but it brings up the complication. The, the collective Lakota community has never taken that because they want some land back. And, and that, is, that has been the subject of some uh, legislation. It's actually been, been not on the floor, but it's actually been introduced before, um, but not lately. And that's because of where Congress sits at the moment. And, and so what gives me hope is this, that, that I think that there is, there is an organized activism on the part of Native communities now, and some heft for various reasons, because of Native organizations, 
quite frankly, in some cases because of, of the resources that some tribes have through casino operations, and they have, they have financial heft, um, that I think Native communities themselves have got to figure out how to sort of start doing this at home. Um, because if you look around at other governmental institutions, whether it's the executive department, the Congress, or the, the court system, it's, it's, you have to be careful because there's danger there, quite frankly, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. The relationship between Indian tribes and the United States government has not been fully actualized. Mm -hmm. Article 6 of the United States Constitution, the second law, mm -hmm. says it's treaty that it's a free law of the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, the treaty language we're not utilizing as effectively as we should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those treaties say that the United States government is responsible for health care mm -hmm. I, I agree with that, and I and I I say that both as one involved in those kinds of affairs with my own tribe, but also as a lawyer. Um, the Black Hills case, which I referred to, um, that was a case where it was a constitutional challenge. You broke the law. You know, you denied due process to the to treaty rights by taking certain land and opening up certain land, and that succeeded. Fishing rights cases. Water rights cases do that, and I, and I think that that uh, tribes are still well advised to do exactly what you say, and look at those treaties, which although broken, are still sitting there and are still the supreme law of the land. To to go back to some of the. In that same article, it says the beautiful African American woman who was the Oh, I remember very well. The Constitution right. of the United States says you do not have to declare your religious beliefs yeah. to be a congressman, a senator, or any other appointed position. Mm -hmm. In other words, America is not a Christian country. Mm -hmm. I wish people would understand that. Yeah. We're not a Christian country. Mm -hmm. You hear me? <laughs> <laughs> We're not a Christian country. <laughs> Actually, when, when Miss Fire Thunder talks, I was telling this to Sherry, and she was and she was originally sitting right in front of me, so I have two, two Lakota women beside me and then and looking at one. Right. And I, I was saying, these are not circumstances where I get out of line. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, that's all funny. Behavior yeah. Here. yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so I think um, the, the question dealt with trends that, mm -hmm. that we're seeing. Yeah. And yeah. again, having 40 years to look back on, you know, in the sense of what have I seen and in, in, in being in the D.C. area, but also working out in community for, for, for a very long time. Um, it's exciting to me, the difference, the things that I'm seeing out there. And just to mention a few, um, the Native people represented in different locations now, all na Native people, in the sense of state legislatures, um, in um, different nonprofit organizations. I did a little research last summer, I think it was, about the number of Native people who are on the boards of private foundations. Uh, not the staff, but the boards. And, and it was, I think I, I identified at least over 50 Native people who were on that. And I'm sure I missed 
you know, a number, um, and ones who are heading private foundations um, there because they're looking at philanthropy and then state legislators and the U.S. Congress. And so their representation is, is building um, in these different places, and I think that's because of the work that has been laid, the groundwork that's been laid, you know, over time. And the other thing that I think is... Um, sort of the civics, I'll call it civics education. So one, one of the things that, that I've had some tribes are doing, I, I wish I knew the number, um, to have a civics education, there are people learning their own history, number one, and then number two, learning native history, I think is really, really important in the sense of, um, you know, understanding the larger picture. Many of the concerns about the Supreme Court are that what one tribe might fight a case, one tribe might fight at the Supreme Court or wind its way there will negatively affect other yeah. tribes. So in the sense of looking at how do we protect some of the basic fundamental things like tribal sovereignty, you know, and how do we, how do we really, um, you know, the, know enough about sort of the larger pan native issues in this country. Um, how do we support, you know, Native Hawaiians in, in their uh, battles? You know, how do we, like in Virginia, the tribes of Virginia were just re, were recognized by the federal government. How do we support the tribes in Maryland who are not, you know, recognized by the federal government? So, and again, you know, it's really a... Um, I think, you know, really seeing that as a trend. And then one final thing that um, I, <laughs> it's, it's sort of this, and tribes. Um, so always say this when you hear the thing, state and federal, and tribes, you know, as so that people recognize that tribes are governments, too. They are the third sovereign in the United States. And so Every time I sat on any sort of government panel or advisory group and stuff, that education piece is so important to say, and tribes, mm -hmm. um, and tribal governments. You know, till you put it in, I served on an advisory council under the Obama administration, and the I was the only Native person with the other people, and they're, they're like, you know, I say, they wrote this report in draft that was going to come out, and I read through it, and I said, and you don't say and tribes. I said, you have. So they had to go back and change the whole thing because I really wasn't going to give in on this, but it's something that, you know, and then, then talking about being an asterisk, too little to count. You know, our numbers are too little to, to count. And so those are the kinds of things I think are uh, we have to keep pushing, and I think that's a positive piece. We have more people now at the table, um, you know, who can make, who could help keep mm -hmm. pushing on those things. Yeah. Let me just add a couple. Mm -hmm. One is that, that I notice, because I'm a news junkie, uh, that the Biden administration was anytime they're talking about the COVID legislation, benefits under it, where it's going, et cetera, et cetera, they almost inevitably also refer to tribes at this yeah. point. And that's that's obviously the communications person there doing something and then making making it making it happen. The other thing I would say is is um, on the the philanthropy point that that Sherry was alluding to. Um, I think that's important. We tend to be, which makes sense given our special relationship with the government, kind of government focused and Washington focused. But there are immense amounts of private resources that sit in philanthropy. And I will myself be personally grateful for what, what uh, Wilma Mankeller did for me, quite frankly, in getting me onto the board of the Ford Foundation when she was the first Native person who had ever been on the board of the Ford Foundation. And... Um, uh, Philanthropy in this country needs to be reformed. I'm thankful, of course, for First Peoples Fund because of what they do in a very focused way. But there are assets sitting out there which we should have much more access to than we do. And and I was delighted uh, by the the discussion at last night's reception about the gift you're getting oh, yeah. from and but but that needs to happen. 
that needs to happen, and philanthropy needs to be totally reformed in that regard. It, it, is, it has been rather unifocused on sort of a historic set of opportunities and, and, and proposed recipients, and um, it needs to be a tool of activism. And people like, uh, like the, the president of the Ford Foundation now, who is African-American himself, um, are much more attuned to that than, than some of those foundations have been in the past. So put that on your checklist, too, when you're talking about trying to round up resources, financial resources for Native communities. Less restrictions on those, too. Pardon, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, with less restrictions. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Um, when we talk about going into, you know, these types of situations today with policy and with the Supreme Court, you know, all these decisions coming up now, um, what does that consultation look like? How often are Native or community members consulted when these decisions are being made today, and what does that what does that even look like with the mm -hmm. consultation? Mm -hmm. I I just say a couple of things. One is that I think every time, and this this is part of what happened when James Aberesk uh, had the special committee. I remember as an attorney. Um, just going through a checklist, whether it was the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Tribal Governmental Tax Status Act, trying to get things embedded in legislation which required that kind of consultation and made it legally actionable if it did not happen. And so it's kind of a two-step process. You, you, you put provisions in legislation which are consistent with our being treated as governments and that we are consulted at the same time state governments are consulted, at the same time directives are given to federal departments, et cetera. And that actually does as a legal matter in terms of seeking administrative release, if it's not uh, relief, if it's not done, um, put us in a position of having standing to enforce the right legally. So that, that is certainly uh, one thing that we can do. Um, and then there's just, you know, there's political action. And you just got to be sometimes out in the streets, um, get it, trying trying to obtain it and pushing for it, um, and that's why that's why native activism, I think, as a political matter, needs to continue to be a movement uh, in this country. Yeah, I think again, seeing over the years, um, co tribal consultation um, elevated again. It's not at what it should be under the Obama administration. I think they were the ones who did the first tribal leaders forum where they would bring all the invite all the, the elected tribal leaders together at least once um, a year and those have been reinstated in the biden um, and then i think they've had at least one um, during that time um, so that's that's a piece and and one thing and i'm, I'm going to mention something that i haven't kept up with as much as i could but is um when you look at international rights and international legislation and policy, that that's really a forum as well, too. The Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has elements in it for free, prior, and informed consent, you know. So there are um, policies within that, that that look at supporting uh, mm -hmm. Native people. So, um, you know, those are important policies as well. I think that's that's right, and even in the the legal area, amongst native lawyers, uh, there were a number uh, who began reaching out to to international forums, whether it was UNESCO, the United Nations, etc. And certainly, the the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People is something which um, the United States, as I understand it, has never actually formally signed on to. But is that my wife is about to correct me? Did yeah. oh they are signed on? Okay. okay, yeah. Qualifications? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. She she was the diplomat. I'm not. <laughs> um, but but yes. So so there are things there which are useful. The uh, code of ethics of the International Council of Museums, which was created. Uh, under by by UNESCO and then sort of spun off is um, another set of ethical considerations 
that at least provides moral heft and authority with respect to things like repatriation. Um, because repatriation, remember, is, can, does not have extraterritorial impact. It does not do anything beyond the borders of the United States. At the NMAI, we did it as a matter of comedy. In other words, as, as something which we felt was right to do, but it was not required by repatriation. As domestically, we were required to do certain things as a legal matter uh, under the repatriation laws. And that's a law that we haven't talked about that much, um, but from a policy standpoint, was extremely significant uh, because much of our things sat and still sits in museums. And um, repatriation was the work of, of uh, many years of effort. Vine Deloria, Suzanne Harjo, they were all there to try to put something in motion which would get some of this material, which never should have been there in the first place, out of museums and back into Native communities. That was a policy decision. It was approved by Congress in the legislation. And it's very important because even beyond requiring the return of certain, as a policy matter and legal matter, of certain kinds of material, um, it shifted the power relationship between museums and Native communities forever. It will never be like it was, and that's good. that's a good thing, uh, because those are institutions, even though they may sit in the private sector, that have immense impact upon us uh, in Native communities because they hold so mu so much of our patrimony. No, go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, I was just going to say with the repatriation, we had. Um, my great grandfather's shirt was returned last year, so yeah. that was you know huge, you know, to our yeah. family. So yeah. yeah, no, no, it's it's true. And I was talking to somebody about it uh, the other day, and and uh, I remember I became director of the NMAI the same year NAGPRA was passed, and I remember going to my my first AAM, the National Museum Association in the United States, meeting after that, and I I had to give a speech about repatriation. And it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be, it was in a room about half this size, and they, were, they set aside enough for 50 people to come. And there were about 300 museum people lined up outside the door, you know, who wanted to get in and, and bear their chests about repatriation, what awful things it was going to do to Native collections. Um, and, uh, you know, we're 30 years later, and it has actually worked. And museums have not succeeded in declaring the law unconstitutional, and they've actually been been, been much more cooperative. So that's another positive development yeah. is the story of, of repatriation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, yeah, it is, it is. Yeah. Sure. So there, there are two things I think that derive from what you just said. And, and that is that um, uh, there is authority under the Repatriation Act to do exactly that, but it has rarely been funded and rarely been and never been funded at a substantial enough level. Uh, but the authority actually sits in the Repatriation Act right now. The second thing I would say is that museums need to be pushed, which is very hard for them to agree to. That. You know, the, 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 the museum think in, in museums conventionally is you have only those things in your collection that are yours, that you hold legal title to. If an item has been repatriated, the museum has lost legal title to it. They don't have it anymore. And so the notion has been, well, then it goes you know, once it's repatriated, we don't have it. It will go back to the tribe. And the problem that Cecilia is talking about rises. But what museums can do, which the NMAI did, 
which the Autry did, um, is to reform their own collections management policies so that under, with the tribe's consent, they continue to hold the material and the, until the tribe is in a position to receive the material back. Think about that. I was just down at Red Cloud Heritage Center and saw their collection, and they're trying to build a building to house it at Red Cloud, the Heritage Center. Yeah. Yeah, but, no. mm -hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And she recorded so many um songs along the Missouri River. Yeah. You know, and and so what happened is that they were able to uh, migrate the music from the mm -hmm. to the high side. Yep. And um they both of us went on to listen to mm -hmm. long story short, so I said, Can you get a copy? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I, I agree. It's it's a question, but I think I know who should own it, um, and and uh, but intellectual property rights and leading to copyright it will become a very critical issue uh, in in that way and more so in the future. Most museums, I think the NMAI has done it. We certainly have done it at the Autry. Um, we have taken the cylinders, the wax cylinders. Uh, and and all of it's been digitized now, and that that material is is freely available to to tribes who link to the resource. I remember being uh, with San Manuel people. That's a, that's a band in Southern California, and uh, we were listening to uh, we were leading a. a a delegation from the tribe, you know, through the collections, and we wanted them to hear this because it was digitized material from one of the coils, and and uh, it was songs that were sung over a hundred years ago. In other words, they were recorded by Lummis, the director, original director of the Southwest Museum of the American Indian, in 1907. And what happened, which was very touching, was that. Some, they had some of the elders in the delegation, and um, and one one of them, uh, and I got to make sure I don't do the same thing, but just sort of entered the room, heard the songs, and burst into tears because he knew who was singing it. It was a relative of his, and. And so it's, it's really important for museums to be pushed to make sure that those, that we work through the intellectual property rights and copyright issues in a way that tribes have direct and unquestioned access to that kind of property. Because ultimately, as a cultural matter, they should. That is their intellectual property. Well, we have one minute left <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> before Emmy comes through. <laughs> Why don't we uh, let some questions, or go ahead. Well, I no, I, I did want to address something that I've seen through some materials recently and, and having, an, having an attorney here, you know, to do this, and it's something that I get questions about when I do, you know, sort of the 101s kinds of presentation is what's the, what's the appropriate terminology? Um, and again, Native Americans, um, 
American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, Native peoples, Indigenous peoples, and, and I just wanted to, having been in Washington when Native Americans was legislated, it is a legislated legal term that includes American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and now Samoans, and I think others. So, so <coughs> to not use it like Native Americans and Alaska Natives and Native Hawaiians, because Native Americans includes those groups, you know, and it was actually was a legislated term that started in the uh, early 70s, mm -hmm. I yeah. think it was, yeah. legislated. So, so in a sense of, of recognizing that. And we've all, you know, I've, I've heard people use so many different terms, you know, indigenous peoples. And I think it's what, what um, I think Native people preferred the term of their tribe, mm -hmm. tribal name, their mm -hmm. historic name. You know, but just being respectful of that, and 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 what's so funny was when you, when we were talking about the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I thought about the naming of We the Peoples before. Uh, Lori didn't mention it last night, but it but it relates to uh, the the use of the term peoples because at the international level, Indigenous peoples fought to have the S on the end, and I, again, I don't know if people know that story because. Um, uh, the, the word it replaced was population, and so we wanted to say we are peoples. We are peoples with the S on the end. And then when I worked at NCAI, Jefferson Keel, who was the vice chair of NCAI at the time, or vice vice president, um, in one of his State of Indian Nations speeches, um, he said, or when he was chair or president of NCAI, he said, you know, his phrase was, we were the people, we were, we were people before, we were peoples before we the people, in the, in, you know, we the people, as you, you see it in the, so that's why we the people, we were peoples before, so yeah, anyway, yeah. but language is important. You I know. want quick, quick sort of relating to what we call ourselves, I mean, our, our word for ourselves, which means human being in China, is this is us. Um, and uh, Cheyenne, and I know I'm saying this being surrounded by Lakota women, <laughs> but but Cheyenne is actually the French corruption of 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 a of a Lakota word that meant painted red and referred to us. Um, so, means you, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, it shows you, you know, you're better off if you call yourself what your language <laughs> yeah, calls you. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. So. Well, thank you so much. Yes, um, thank you. Wow, I just, uh, I was able to listen to um, Sherry's presentation a few months ago, going over all of the different policies. And I remember listening to her and thinking, I wonder how many times she's given this presentation before. <laughs> and, you know, I've been... Um, trying to go back and follow, there's a podcast called This Land, and season two covers the ICWA case right now, mm -hmm. and does a really good job of breaking down the Supreme Court, you know, and the, how the effects of it, and, and they talk about how the Supreme Court justices are coming in with no knowledge about us and these policies, and, um, and just that constant need to educate every single space that you go into, <laughs> having to go back and, you know, re-educate again and again. Um, so I'm really grateful for this information because we have, Sherry, you know, gave us her presentation to use for our curriculum and said you can have whatever you need from this. Um, just giving it to us, you know, freely is so amazing. And then to be able to have this discussion where we can really contextualize and analyze it and put it into perspective, you know, it's going to help so much with this curriculum that we're doing and getting this information out. So I'm so grateful to the both of you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor to be on. And to yes, be with absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, one of the great challenges I see is I live and work in my reservation and my mm -hmm. community is that more people need to know what we know at home. Mm -hmm. How do we reach the masses at home? Mm -hmm. How do we uh, 
let them know the beauty of their culture. We're missing that boat. Everybody, there's an upper level of knowledge that has to reach the people themselves. And, and that, to me, is my greatest challenge. How can I reach more people in my community? And because when you take a look at uh, high school job heart rate, uh, how, and, and with the high rate of financial poverty, people are just trying to get by day by day. Who has time to watch the hearing? Who has time to read? Who has time? How can we reach our people? Because you and I know when, when, you, when you feel so good about who you are, your culture, your language, everything that just strengthens you. And unfortunately, what we know does not reach the people who need to know. So that to me, as, a, as an individual person, is my greatest challenge mm -hmm. to reach the people mm -hmm. so they feel good about who they are. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. There's I a privilege being here in Washington, D.C. today. That's a privilege for me. Yeah, and I want to hurry up and go home. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I think we have about 15 minutes.